Well, hello, my name is Al Meredith. I'm Pastor Emeritus here at Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Come to you with our weekly broadcast, podcast, live streaming. I don't know what you call it. I just know I teach the lesson, been doing it since COVID hit before that. And we've made it a weekly thing and God has blessed it. We're in the middle of a series on transforming questions that God asks us. Certainly not because God doesn't know the answer. But there's something about good questions that can bring truth to our minds. And so today we find ourselves in the 18th chapter of Genesis, and we're dealing with Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now let me pray, and we'll get started. Lord, your word promises that your strength is made perfect in weakness. And you know I'm tired, I'm weary, don't know why. And so, Lord, I make myself available for your Holy Spirit to speak truth through me, and may it be truth that transforms the lives of me and everyone listening in. From back home in Michigan to Georgia to here in Texas and in some cases around the world, thank you, Father, for each listener. Reward their time today in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but history is predominated by men for good or bad reasons. Whether it be villains or heroes, the hallways are lined with the bodies of men, whether it's Hitler or Churchill. Whether it's thinkers or idiots, Galileo or the papacy who imprisoned him because he proved that Copernicus was right. Generally speaking, history records few prominent women. There are a few. Joan of Arc of France, and Catherine the Great of Russia, and Cleopatra of Egypt, and Elizabeth the Great of England. But apart from these few, relatively few women, in Hebrews 11, some of you will recall, we have the great hall of faith. That's the great chapter. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it goes on and gives a number of examples of people of faith. And almost every one of them are men. Only two women are listed in Hebrews 11 as examples of faith. Do you recall who they were? One, interesting enough, was Rahab the harlot. And the other was Sarah, the mother of faith, the wife of Abraham. Scripture records that Sarah lived 127 years. She's the only woman in the Bible whose age is recorded, God understanding the vanity of women. I don't know, but anyhow, 127 years. One of the toughest Sundays of the year for me as a pastor has always been Mother's Day. You know, we think of Mother's Day and preach from Proverbs 31 about who can find a virtuous woman her price is far above rubies for she goes afar and buys a field for her family and clothes them in scarlet and she rises before the sun and she goes to bed long after it goes down and she sounds like a modern day super capitalist. But the trouble with Mother's Day is Mother's Day is not always a joyful memory for many women out there. You have single women who are longing desperately for a spouse and somehow God doesn't answer their prayer. You have childish women who are desperate for offspring and somehow their womb is barren. You have the mothers of rebellious teenagers who are plagued by guilt as the wicked one says it's all your fault. You have divorcees whose homes have exploded in spite of their deepest efforts. You have housewives who are languishing in uh, dead relationships. Would not Sarah make a good patron saint for struggling women? Let me remind you of the context of Genesis 8, 18. Sarah is now 90 years old. Her biological clock has not slowed. It has stopped long since. She's childless, she's barren, she's guilt-ridden, she's scornful. And with that in mind, I want to read for you verses 10 through 15 of Genesis 18. Abraham's being visited by a theophany, a pre-incarnate representation of Christ, and two angels, they come and drop in on him. And Abraham is feeding him. And in verse 10, God says, to Abraham, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. 
And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, <laughs> Have I grown old? Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? She said, hey, hey. She'd long passed the time of conjugal relationships with Abraham. And God says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, No, Sarah, you did laugh. Well, it is all about trust. It's all about faith. I love, it's really a hymn. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Well, before we look at Sarah's faith, I want to look at Sarah's doubts. Let's talk about doubts in general to begin with. There's some widespread myths out there, especially among Christians, about doubts. One of them is that real Christians never doubt, or at least hardly ever doubt. I remember sitting around the faculty table at lunch at a college in South Carolina where my wife and I taught, and the Old Testament professor there kind of proudly saying, I've been a Christian for 63 years, and I never once doubted. And my jaw almost fell into my plate. Are you kidding me? I want to check him for a pulse. H had he been dead these last 50 years? It was Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. If you've never looked inward with questions and doubts, you really haven't lived. Vital faith involves risks, and risk involves doubts. It necessitates uncertainties, questions, or doubts. Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player of all time, once said, you miss every shot on goal you do not take. Most Christians are safety first wimps. Our most common salutation when we say goodbye is, well, take care. I do that all the time and I, I shouldn't. It ought to be take risks. Faith is taking risks for God. In Hebrews 10, 38, God says, the just shall live by faith, but... If any shrink back, I will have no pleasure in them. We're a generation of shrinker backers. We get to the brink and, oh, I don't know. And so we back off and God says, I have no pleasure in you if you don't take risk. And when you take risk, it involves doubt. Think of our spiritual ancestors. Adam, what did he do? He ran and hid. Think of Abraham. He lied about Sarah, his wife. Think of Moses who fled to the desert. Eliza, Elijah who under the juniper tree is suicidal. Peter who denied Jesus Christ three times while he warmed himself at the enemy's fire. Guys, doubt is part of our spiritual DNA. It's our ecclesiastical ancestry. So don't tell me real Christians never doubt. There's a second myth and it kind of was founder of the first one, that all doubting is sin. The Greek word for doubt literally means of two minds. Should I, should I not? What should I do? It's uncertainty, it's hesitancy. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief, a refusal to obey even when you know what God has said. Doubt says, I just don't know. I'm not sure. Unbelief says, I don't care what God says. I ain't doing it. So it's not doubt. Doubt is, is caught in between. All doubt is not sin. I, I, this is not my notes, but it comes to my mind. In the book of Jude, just before Revelation, there's only one verse, one chapter rather. Hope I can find it. Yes, Jude, verse 22, it says, On some have compassion, making a distinction. That word for distinction in King James literally means doubters. 
Have compassion on doubters. Be understanding. They're not saying I won't obey. They're just saying I'm just not sure what to do. Well, that's Sarah's doubts. I want to look secondly at Sarah's fears because it was her fear that was her foundation for faith. Think of it again. Sarah was born and raised in one of the largest cities of the ancient world, one of the oldest cities, Ur of the Chaldees, at the mouth of the Euphrates as it poured into the Persian Gulf. She came, obviously, from a prominent wealthy family. Her name, Sarah, means precious. She was loved and cherished by her wealthy family. She left home with her husband. She left her loved ones. She left her family. She left her familiar surroundings for who knows where. Abraham, where has God told you where to go? I don't know. He just said, pack up. Well, where are we going? I don't know. We'll know when we get there. I wonder how that would fly with all of the housewives that are listening in today. I know a few, and it wouldn't fly. Until you have specific plans, the Sarahs in our world ain't packing a thing. Yet she does. And as they travel, as they journey twice, she is passed off as Abraham's sister because of her beauty. And God miraculously spares her and yet still she is childless. She becomes so desperate she resorts to plan B. Well, maybe I'm not the one to mother the descendants. What about my handmaiden, Hagen, Hagar? And so Abraham goes and sleeps with her. Sure enough, she has a son. And it brings familial chaos in the family. Almost absolute ruin. And the result of that, Ishmael, the son, is the father of all the Arab peoples in the world today. That's where ISIS came from. That's where Saudi terrorists came from. Plan B is never a good substitute for God's will for you. I, I, I just got to stop here for a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn me to the book of Isaiah. I'm reading through that right now in my devotions. Chapter 50. For those of you who are desperate and run out of patience on God, on getting your prayers answered and deciding maybe to take matters into your own hands. It was Spurgeon who said, when you take the bull by the horns, you end up getting gored. Isaiah chapter 50, verses 10 and 11. Who among you fears the Lord? Sarah did. I do. Who obeys the voice of his servant? Many of you do. Yet who walks in darkness and has no light? Guys, listen to me. It is indeed possible to be faithful to God, to obey Him in all that you know to do, to continue to serve and worship Him even when the, and the darkness settle in upon your life. It's what St. John the Divine calls the dark night of the soul. When all of a sudden it seems like you're, the skies are brass, none of your prayers go answered, like God has abandoned you and God is hiding himself from you. And Isaiah refers to God as the God who hides himself. What are you going to do? Here's what Isaiah says. If this has happened to you, let him continue to trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Now here's the warning. Look, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire and the sparks you have kindled. Then you shall have from my hand, this you shall, you shall lie down in torment. When your prayers go unanswered, it seems as though God has abandoned you. And so you decide to take matters into your own hand. You light your own fire to try to assuage the darkness. You make your own plans. You go ahead with your own ideas. Well, if this didn't work out, I'll try this. You shall lie down in torment. That's what happened to Sarah and Abraham. As they got impatient, though I understand, believe me, I understand, waiting is the hardest spiritual discipline of all. And they couldn't wait any longer, so Sarah offers Hagar, and Abraham eagerly accepts, and Ishmael is the result, and all hell is breaking loose in history subsequently. Plan B. Well, now in Genesis 18, she's 90 years old. 
And the angel of the Lord comes and promises her a son. Her dream has long since been dead. She's given up. And so it says, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. What kind of a laugh do you think that was? It wasn't cheerful, happy, oh, goody, goody. I suspect it was a laugh of scorn and derision. Lord, that's not funny. I've cried myself to sleep so many times. I've lost the ability to cry, and now you're telling me at 90 I'm going to have a son? What kind of a joke is this? How can you tease me like that, Lord? By the way, do you notice he said she laughed within herself. The only one that heard her laugh was Almighty God. He heard her. So what's God's response to her laughter? Another question, searching question. He says, is anything too hard for me? Remember I said the issue is trust. You don't have the record here, but God had already revealed himself to Abraham and Sarah as El Shaddai, the awesome thundering one, the one who spoke the stars into being. Do you really think a son, even at 90, is too hard a task for Almighty God? Think of the creations. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, which was sent up in 2005, scientists have begun to measure the vastness of the universe. As of that time, there appears to be, we've gotten pictures of over, and these numbers are going to stun you, over 200 billion galaxies, galaxies in the universe. Each galaxy with over 200 billion stars. Guys, that comes to a total of 40 billion trillion stars. I'll get a headache if I start to try to grasp that. Add to that another 10 billion trillion stars in the unobserved dwarf galaxies that are too small for our telescope. We know they're there. You have a total of 50 billion trillion stars that we've seen through our telescope. Someone said, I don't know if this helps, if each of those 50 billion trillion stars were a dime and you could pack them tightly together, they would cover all the North American continent 1,500 feet deep. The problem is what astronomers sears, see is not exactly what is, but what was. Keep in mind that a galaxy two billion light years away shows up on our telescopes two billion years later, after the light was emanated. Between that time, that's two billion years, new novas, new stars, new galaxies are born moving further and further away from us. The bottom line is our universe is at least 10 times larger than what we perceive. Someone has estimated over 700 billion trillion stars. And the Bible gives five words, and he made the stars also. And you think, Sarah, a son is too difficult for me? I don't know what impossible situation you're facing in your life right now. Your dream may be long since dead years ago. And you've just pushed it underneath to keep from railing against God. And you've given up, perhaps, on that dream. But I want you to know El Shaddai knows the deepest longings of your heart. And if he's withheld anything from you, it is for your good. I can remember my freshman year in college at Grand Rapids Baptist College. We came on campus. They had just begun to build the campus out there in Grand Rapids. And they weren't quite done, but they had to start the semester. So we did. In fact, it was two weeks before we had hot water in the men's dorm. And the electricians were just finishing off their work. Well, we had dorm parents. I can't remember their names. But I remember the little baby girl. She was about nine months old. And I came back from classes one afternoon, and she was playing on the carpet in the lounge alone for a little bit. Her parents just got tied up for something. And she discovered something shiny and new and looking at it and playing with it. 
And I looked down and it was a razor blade that the electricians had somehow left behind. And she was, I could just see she was getting ready to put it in her mouth like babies do with everything. And who knows what terrible damage. And quietly, graciously, I took her little pudgy hand and pulled the razor blade away. And she let up a wail. You'd have thought I'd have shocked her with a taser. Her parents came running, what's the matter? And I held up the blade. And she's screaming, and clawing, oh, Al, how could you be so cruel and mean to me? Because I loved her. If God has withheld anything of your dream to this point, it's only because he loves you. Every dream that God begets eventually will bring salvation. And nothing is too hard for God. So we come to Sarah's faith. Let me read about it in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. The great faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also re received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged God faithful who had promised. First of all, it says back in Genesis that Sarah was afraid. It was only God who could hear her laugh within herself from the next room. I think the point is that up until now, God had been dealing directly with Abraham, her husband, and not directly with Sarah. Now God deals directly with her. And she realizes she and her husband are in this together. It's just not hers to follow her husband wherever he goes. God not only called Abraham to be the father of faith, but Sarah to be the mother of faith. And God is dealing directly with her. And she has a healthy fear of God that fosters an even more healthy faith in God. That great verse in Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman, the last thing it says about her in verse 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. A healthy fear of God and who he is is the foundation of fear. William Coper puts it this way in his great hymn, The Lord moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the seas and he rides on every storm. The last verse, there's about six or seven verses, goes like this. Fear God, ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Make you his pleasure your delight. He'll make your wants his care. Someone has said if we fear God, we need fear nothing else. If we don't fear God, we better fear everything else. It is a healthy fear of God that is the foundation for genuine faith and the results of her faith. In Hebrews, which I just read, she receives strength to conceive because she judged him faithful. She didn't have enough faith. But 2 Timothy 2.13 says, When we are faithless, then he remains faithful. When we are unbelieving, he remains faithful still. He is faithful even when we are not. Oh, so many songs. Finally, Sarah's obedience. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6. Well, let me read the first four verses. Wives, be submission to your own husband, submissive to your own husbands, that even if some of your husbands do not obey the word, they will without a word be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct, accompanied by respect. For in this manner, verse 5, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with terror. Guys, the final proof of faith is obedience. Years ago, I did a January Bible study. We used to do those as Southern Baptists, and the book to study was the book of Hebrews. 
And when I got to Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter, I had to sit down and wrestle. When I melted all down, what is faith all about? And I finally came to the conclusion, faith is obeying God no matter what. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not a mental calibration. Faith is not a creed you say you had heart. Your faith isn't faith until it's tested and you choose to obey no matter what the circumstances. The final proof of faith is obedience. We sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. So cotton picking what? Big deal. You've decided. Now follow him. It doesn't become faith until it results in action. Sarah submitted to her husband Abraham. And I got to admit, that would have been a hard thing for me to swallow. Abraham was not a paragon of virtue. He was a coward. But she submitted to him because she submitted herself to God first. Submission is not just for women. It is an inescapable universal command for all of us. In, in, in Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. But just a verse before that, in verse 22, it says, Submit yourselves to one another. All of us are called to submit. All of us are called to obey, to a life of obedience as indicative of faith. I remember reading of a young sentry who was on duty for the first time. He was there at the guard gate, and he had the orders. No one was to pass without proper identification. A big limo drove up with a four-star general sitting in the back. And he lowered the window electrically, and he said, Sentry, I'm General Smith, Private. Drive on, driver. And the sentry said, Excuse me, sir, I'm new at this job. Who do I shoot first, you or the driver? <laughs> I love that kind of obedience. And I think God does too. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Guys, the word is so clear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In spite of your questions, obey God. In spite of your doubts and fears, obey God, for he is faithful. Whether or not you feel like it, trust, obey, be faithful. Elie Wiesel was a Jew during World War II who spent several years in Auschwitz, started when he was 14 years old, and somehow managed to survive the greatest of all the death camps that the Nazis had produced. One night, the prisoners in their barracks decided to put God on trial for all the horrors of the Holocaust. Men, these were Jewish men of lifelong faith in their God, but their faith had failed them, and now their loved ones had died. They'd been tortured, and here they were slowly dying. The so-called prosecuting attorney against God, charged of families torn apart, beaten, abused, and tortured, burned alive in the gas ovens there of Auschwitz and Treblinka. The de defense attorney for God tried to answer, but it all fell on deaf ears in that dark, cold prison barracks. In the end, they found God guilty of abandoning his children, maybe even guilty of not even existing. The mood was dark. The lights went out. Silence and depression settled upon them as they lay there on their beds. Then when the whistle for lights out came, these same men got down on their knees like they had done all their lives and prayed the evening prayer to the God they doubted. Like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I hope you will too. Lord Jesus, give us that kind of faith. I'm so grateful that you are a faithful God, that even we and we are unbelieving, you are faithful still. Encourage every heart within the sound of my voice to keep trusting you no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless.